Well, it's good to see everyone here this evening. If you're visiting with us, and we have a few visitors tonight, we're glad to have you here. And of course, you know you're always welcome to be among us and to come back and be with us. Ever since uh, we've looked at the second half of the book, starting in chapter 12, uh, we've noted this emerging theme of a great conflict. The first half of the book was an emphasis on God's judgment on the enemies of God's people. The second half of the book perhaps emphasizes more the conflict and the nature of it. That conflict has been presented to us in various symbols. And again, our approach has been that we're not looking at a chronological telling of a story here, but a repeated story. Tell it to us one way, and then it's told another way, and then told another way. And so each time the story is retold, we get a little bit more information, another aspect of the story. But the basic conflict was described for us in chapter 12 in the imagery of the woman and the dragon, God's people versus Satan uh, and his uh, attempt to destroy them on the earth. And we saw in chapter 13 how Satan plans to do that by his uh, helpers or his minions, the beast that came up out of the sea and the beast that came up out of the earth. And together, these three form kind of an evil partnership. And we see that they were mentioned, I think, in chapter 16 uh, as a trio. We saw in chapter 16 and verse 13, the dragon, the beast, and the third beast is called a false prophet there. But it is the same three that we saw introduced in chapters 12 and 13. Uh, we noted then in chapter 14 that God is going to protect his people, that uh, he has marked, he has noted, he has stamped, he has sealed those who are his, and those who are not his are going to be destroyed along with the beast and with the dragon. And we saw that unfolded uh, in chapter 15 as a scene of great rejoicing. And there are a couple of times, and we're going to see this again, I think, before the book is over, that John will flash forward and say, let me tell you how this turns out. And we see the great rejoicing in heaven with God's people victorious, having come out of their tribulations faithful and saved, and their enemies are no more. But John came back in chapter 16 to the judgment of God's enemies of his people, and so we noted there the outpouring of the seven bowls of wrath, including this uh, very well-known section on the so-called Battle of Armageddon, which is never described in chapter 16. We're told that they are gathered together. The dragon, the false beast, uh, the false prophet, and the, the beast are gathered together, gathering the kings of the earth together to fight against God, to destroy his kingdom, to uh, put off his reign. And then, without any description of a battle, we're told in the latter part of chapter 16 that it's all over. The enemy is destroyed, Babylon has fallen, and uh, everything about her is gone. And we noted that it's probably kind of useless for John to describe the actual conflict, because that's really not all that important. And John's purpose is not to tell them what they're going to go through in detail. His purpose is to tell them the bigger picture, that you're fighting a satanic force, and that this government that seems to have turned against you is not just the Roman government, it is a tool in the hand of Satan. And you should know that the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you serve, is going to overthrow it and defeat it, and defeat the power behind it as well. And so with that, uh, we come to chapter 17. Uh, and chapter 17 is, I think, one of the more difficult chapters in the book. And that might seem strange because uh, of what we find here. In the first six verses, we have a vision. And it's a pretty standard vision. It's really not a whole lot different from anything else that we would have seen up until this point. Maybe a couple new images, but it's the same kind of thing we've seen. But the hard part is the explanation. Starting in verse 7, 
uh, John is wondering at what he has seen, this great sight. And the angel says, well, why do you wonder? I will tell you all about it. And the latter part of the chapter is the explanation. And the explanation is ten times harder than the symbolism itself. So for that reason, uh, this chapter can be a little bit difficult. Uh, but I think the point of it is clear enough that God is going to again describe the enemy. He wants his people to understand just exactly what it is that you're up against. And then having described this enemy, God is then going to describe its judgment and its uh, overthrow. And so let's start in chapter 17 and verse 1. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, and these are the seven bowls of wrath from the previous chapter. Remember that they were introduced to us in chapter 16 and verse 1, these angels that are the messengers of the Lord's wrath and the instruments of his destruction. Uh, one of them came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Here we have now the, the same enemy, uh, but now in different imagery. And she is identified, first of all, as a great harlot. And we're told immediately that I'm going to show you her destruction. The word judgment does not just mean pronouncing of a decision in a, some kind of neutral sense, but very often in the Bible it has the sense of condemnation. And so here's another picture I want you to see, John, of what God is going to do to your enemy. But here the enemy is described as a harlot who sits on many waters and a harlot with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. We can take this uh, opportunity here uh, to notice something about the text. We have been taking the approach throughout our study that the enemy that is being described in the book is Rome. Rome and the emperor cult in particular, as it was going to be forced upon Christians in the days that were shortly to come after this. Well, very often uh, you will hear, and I think it is growing in popularity, that the book of Revelation is about the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, that's a view that has been around for some time. Uh, my impression is that that view is becoming more popular among uh, people in our own fellowship. But there are several things in chapter 17, it seems, that would mitigate against that. First of all, here in verse 1, this enemy that is described as the great harlot, we are told, sits on many waters. There's really no way to get that to be a description of Jerusalem. Jerusalem sits in the mountains of Judea. There is not a river that goes from the Mediterranean to Jerusalem. Uh, any kind of cargo and, and goods had to be unloaded at Caesarea, put on wagons, and carted into the hills up the mountains to Jerusalem. Uh, now, somebody might say, well, Jerusalem is not that far from the coast, uh, maybe, but nobody in the ancient world would have believed that Jerusalem sat on many waters, even figuratively. Uh, it was a land-based city, and there was no water around it. The only water associated with Jerusalem that I know of is the Gihon Spring, which is smaller than the little creeks that run through this community. So that should be one clue. Uh, there's another one in verse 4. We have this woman clothed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, uh, having in her uh, hand a gold cup full of abominations and so forth. Notice she is clothed in purple and scarlet. What kind of people wore purple and scarlet in the ancient world? Kings, royalty. And so this woman is a royal figure. Now, 
You might argue that there is some royal language used of Jerusalem in the Old Testament. Uh, you are a royal priesthood, God said of the Israelites uh, in Exodus. But he wasn't speaking of Jerusalem. He was speaking of the people there as being royal. Uh, and in the first century, nobody would have thought of Jerusalem as a royal anything. Remember that Jerusalem is on a on the edge of the Roman Empire. It's out in the sticks, on the fringe. It was a, a subject kingdom that was known for its hostility and for its causing trouble. Nobody looked at Jerusalem as a great world power, and certainly was not a seat of royal power when John wrote this book. But everybody would have understood that if you're talking about royal power, kingdom, that kind of thing, that the only kingdom to speak about was Rome. And so that's another argument. Uh, there's a depiction of uh, what John sees here, this uh, woman dressed in scarlet and purple sitting on this ugly-looking beast with seven heads and ten horns. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, remember back to what we said at the beginning of our study that the book is designed for you to read with your imagination. And this is one of the most imaginative scenes in all the book. It is designed to be a graphic and a frightening image of this terrifying great figure that spans the waters. And we're going to see, uh, as John here refers to her as a harlot, that the point of this description is that this is a wicked empire not a benevolent empire, it's not anybody's savior or anything like that, that this is a wicked empire and it is hostile to God and to God's people. Uh, another indication that this is Rome is found in verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. You say in the ancient world, the city of seven hills, the city that sits on seven hills. And everybody understood exactly what you meant. You were talking about Rome and no other place. And there have been attempts, I've seen some of them, to describe Jerusalem as a city that sits on seven hills, but it doesn't. It sits on Mount Zion. And if you really, really wanted to get picky, you could divide Mount Zion into two parts, but that's about it. Uh, but to say the city of seven hills in the ancient world was like saying the Big Apple or the Windy City in modern times, that those phrases really only refer to one place. And then look also at verse 18. The woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And again, nobody in the first century would have thought of Jerusalem if you would have said, I'm talking about the city that reigns over the whole earth. No, they would have thought of Rome, the city that had become a kingdom, the city that had become an empire. And so it seems to me that uh, any Jerusalem approach to the book of Revelation uh, pretty much founders when it comes to chapter 17. Now, let's go back uh, to the description here. Uh, I saw a great harlot sitting on many waters. We have suggested, of course, all along that John's talking about the Roman Empire, but John here is taking a, an especially hard swipe, it seems to me, at the Roman Empire, because there was a particular goddess that was associated with Rome, and she was simply called Roma. And she was the female personification of the Roman Empire. And if you were to go throughout the cities of Asia Minor, Pergamum, Ephesus, places like that, there were very often in those cities temples to the goddess Roma. And she is quite commonly depicted in Roman art uh, you see her here on this coin, and it, Roma is spelled out. Here she is uh, in a chariot, and here again is Roma uh, riding here uh, victoriously. Um, on the back of that coin are the, uh, the twins 
uh, galloping with their spears pointed forward. Uh, Roma is on the front, and you'll notice that she has a war helmet on her head. She is very often depicted in a warlike garb. Uh, this statue right here is in one of the museums in Rome. Uh, sits out in front of the street out there. And uh, this is a typical pose for her. You'll notice that she has an orb in her left hand. That signifies the inhabited earth. And so Rome ruled the entire earth in the first century. Uh, she usually is depicted with this spear, an instrument of war, and the war helmet as well. And so she is a personification of Rome, but specifically a personification of Rome in her ability to wage war. And it seems to me that John is drawing on that symbolism here as well. Here we have on the front, again, Roma, uh, and on the back we have the god Jupiter riding in a four-horse carriage with a branch and a thunderbolt. Remember that the emperors associated themselves often with Jupiter, the king of the gods, the greatest of the gods. And so that imagery is combined on this coin here. Uh, here's another one. Uh, here we have Roma wearing the laurel crown. Remember, that is often associated with Augustus. And then on the back, we have a statue of a triumphant general, and he is on top of a triumphal arch. And again, emphasizing victory, conquest, the ability to win in warfare, and that is uh, the image of Roma. Uh, here's another one, here's Roma and the she-wolf with the twins Romulus and Remus, uh, indicating the founding of Rome on that coin. But again, she is dressed like a warrior on the front of the coin. Uh, this is a rather interesting piece of uh, uh, sculpture. It's called the Gemma Augustea. Uh, this thing is about seven inches tall and about 10 inches wide. I've never seen it in person. I'm not sure exactly. I think it's in a museum in Germany someplace. Uh, but it illustrates the, the thing that we're talking about. This is about the deification of Augustus. After he has died, he has now gone and he has joined the gods. Uh, you'll notice that there are two levels in the sculpture. The bottom level is the world of men. The top level is the world of the gods. And here is Augustus and the eagle remember, is the Roman eagle. That's the symbol of the god Jupiter. So he is sitting on the throne of Jupiter. He is now associated with the king of the gods, and he is being crowned with this crown here that indicates his great status among the Romans. And sitting right next to him is this female figure here, and that's Roma. Again, she has a spear in her hand. She has the helmet on underneath her feet are the shields and the armor of all the enemies that she has defeated. And then in the lower panel, you see these two people here. This is one of their enemies. He's got his hands tied behind his back. This woman is one of the captives. And they are here raising a trophy uh, to their conquest. They have defeated these people, and they are now going to be uh, uh, symbols of their uh, power. The point is that Roma was a very familiar image, especially to people in Asia Minor. Uh, my understanding is that the goddess Roma was not worshipped in Rome, but only in the provinces, like Asia Minor. And so when John is in this book talking about an enemy, and he says, I saw a woman, well, everybody knew what woman John was talking about, He's talking about this goddess that represents Rome. Uh, here is a uh, picture from Ephesus. Uh, you're looking there at the ruins of the temple to Roma in the city of Ephesus. And so right behind this, on this big spot up here, is where the temple to the emperor stood. So there was the temple to the goddess and then the temple to the emperor right behind that, no mistaking uh, where their loyalties lay. Now, of course, I suggested to you that uh, John is here taking a hard swipe at the Romans. You think about what John is saying here. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. 
your goddess is a whore, is what John is saying to the Romans here. That this thing that you have set up as being this, this personification of power and victory, this, this woman warrior that personifies the fertility and the power of Rome, as far as I'm concerned, she's a harlot. And that's how God looks at her. She sits on many waters, uh, but she is no, no great and benevolent figure. John is going to draw on several Old Testament texts in our uh, study here. Jeremiah 50 and 51 is where he's going to get most of his imagery. Of course, Jeremiah there describes the fall of Babylon, which happened, of course, many years after his own day. Uh, much of the imagery also comes from Ezekiel 26, 27, and 28, where God speaks there about his judgment on the city of Tyre. It shouldn't surprise us that the imagery of Tyre shows up here. Remember, Tyre sat on the coast of the Mediterranean. And the Phoenicians in the ancient world were known for what? Does anybody remember? Shipbuilding, trading all over the Mediterranean. They were a city that did business over many waters as well, just like Rome. A city that had become rich by trading with other nations. Uh, there's some language here from Nahum chapter 3 in the fall of Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria, the great world power of its day, and Isaiah 23, again, the fall of Tyre, and Isaiah 47, the fall of Babylon. So what John is going to do is he's going to take pieces of these great texts that talk about the destruction of great world empires, great powerful empires, and he's going to kind of weave them together to talk about the destruction of this one, the Roman Empire. So she is described as a great harlot in the tradition of Tyre, Nineveh, and Babylon. Uh, that language is used of all of those cities in the Old Testament. And as a harlot, she has been an influence and an encouragement to evil. The idea of an enticement. Think about the first several chapters of Proverbs where the author there warns against the, the harlot, the adulteress, and her ways and how cunning she is and how pleasurable she seems to be. Well, that's the picture here of the Roman Empire. Everybody wanted to do business with Rome. There was a lot of money to be made. And everybody wanted their, their hand in the pie, as it were, because the Romans were prosperous and, and things were going good uh, if you did business with them. And in that way, with her materialism and her greed, she enticed many nations to do business with her. Uh, we are told that in verse 1, she sits on many waters, suggesting that she reigns like a king or a queen would sit on a throne. And like we said, many waters is a fitting description of the Roman Empire itself. The fact that she is a harlot, of course, is not a surprise to us, and we, we know from the Old Testament what this is all about. That harlotry is a figure for idolatry, and idolatry in the Old Testament is another way of talking about living by the lust of the flesh, worldliness, and materialism. What were the idols of the ancients? They were personifications of forces that could make you rich and powerful if you could control them. And so you worshiped fertility gods and you worshiped gods of rain and you worshiped gods of, of conception and all those other things because you believed that they could help you out uh, in a fleshly way. Of course, Rome has been depicted over and over in the book of Revelation as steeped in idolatry and especially with the emperor cult, men posing as gods and in Hosea 4, we hear a harlotry wine and new wine take away the understanding. My people consult their wooden idol. Their diviner's wine informs them a spirit of harlotry has led them astray, and they've played the harlot departing from their God. Now, God there is talking about Israel, but the same kind of charges could be leveled against the Romans, that they have turned their back on God. They have refused to acknowledge Jesus, the true deity uh, and emperor of the world, and they have uh, rather consulted their vain idols. 
And so because this empire has turned its back on God, it is fit to be judged. Uh, Isaiah 23, we said, is one of the sources for John's imagery here. Look at verse 17. It will come about at the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre. She will go back to her harlot's wages and will play the harlot with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Keep that in mind. Uh, the Lord there talks about destroying Tyre, but then it comes back. And we're going to see another trace of that here in Revelation 17 in a moment. Uh, verse 2, the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, that is, they, they participated with Rome in various ways. And those who dwell on the earth, we've seen that phrase a lot in the book, it always refers to unbelievers. Those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And you have to remember what we saw in chapter 14, that chapter that was full of the imagery of the wine and the wine press. Wine imagery suggests reaping, destruction, the crushing of the grapes, and uh, that kind of thing is uh, in the background here as well. So, uh, verse 3, He carried me away in the Spirit. Uh, that little phrase might seem innocent enough, but actually it's used a bunch of times in the book of Ezekiel when Ezekiel is shown what God is going to do to a wicked nation. And that seems to be the sense of it here as well. That uh, this is not John's insight, this is heaven's revelation of what God is going to do. And he says that he carried me away into a wilderness. Uh, this language of a wilderness is used in Isaiah chapter 21 as God is about to destroy Babylon. Uh, Isaiah 21.1, The oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea. As windstorms in the Negev sweep on, it comes from the wilderness from a terrifying land. A harsh vision has been shown to me. The treacherous one still deals treacherously, and the destroyer still destroys. Go up, Elam, lay siege, media... I have made an end of all the groaning she has caused. So God there is going to judge Babylon, put an end to all the suffering that she has caused the other nations, and uh, it is called the oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea. You get that same thing here, that same sense of a wilderness. Uh, a wilderness can be a place of evil and hostile conditions in the biblical way of thinking uh, we saw in chapter 12 that the woman was taken away into the wilderness, and even though she is protected by God, it is a place of testing as well. And interestingly, in Jeremiah 50 and 51, God says he's going to turn Babylon basically into a wilderness, into a desert, just a pile of sand, uh, that it would be that way perpetually. And uh, if anyone is still kind of wanting to try to take this literally, I think this is one of those verses where you run into trouble because the harlot sits on waters, but she is in a wilderness. And you wonder, well, how can she be in both at the same time? Well, it's not literal. Uh, if you ask that question, it means that you're not reading it correctly. Kind of like Isaiah 21, the oracle of the wilderness of the sea. You combine the imagery to get the point of it. Um, that which is dangerous, evil, hostile, uh, oppressive, like a wilderness and like a sea at the same time. Uh, we noted uh, here in verse 4 that she is clothed in scarlet, and she is sitting on a scarlet beast in verse 3. Again, scarlet being the color of royalty. But remember, red is also the color of blood, and there's always kind of those two sides to it in the book. Uh, and it is also in Jeremiah 4 the color that is associated with luxury. Uh, scarlet and purple was an expensive dye. Uh, it was made uh, in one of the uh, cities of the book of Revelation. Uh, remember, Lydia was a seller of purple dye. Um, and it was, uh, it was something that only rich people normally could afford. So very often it is associated with luxurious materialistic, fleshly-type living. Uh, notice in verse 3 that the beast 
uh, is full of blasphemous names, has seven heads and ten horns. And if you've been paying attention to the book, you would say immediately, well, I know what this is, because that is the very description that we were given of the beast that came out of the sea in chapter 13 and verse 1. It had ten horns and seven heads, and on his heads were blasphemous names. So if the first beast is Rome, then the beast here is Rome as well, and the woman is a personification of her sinfulness. So putting it all together, what does the woman symbolize? Well, John tells us in verse 18, the woman whom you saw is the great city. It's Rome. The people, the culture, the materialism, the greed, the power, all of those things that made it detestable in God's sight, uh, that's what this woman represents. And you'll notice in verse 16, uh, we have this harlot who is going to be made desolate and naked, and they will eat her flesh and burn her up with fire. There is a famous story, of course, of a woman in the Old Testament whose flesh was eaten, and that's Jezebel, who also was an idolater and who brought Baal worship into God's people and tempted them with that and oppressed them with that. And so there's a little hint of that in this narrative as well, uh, that she has that same kind of judgment as this idolater, and the whore is Roman culture, therefore, uh, in all of her aspects. The vision continues in verse 4, the woman with, was clothed in purple and scarlet, and so, again, an image of royalty and luxury, and that complements uh, the gold and the precious stones and the pearls, decked out with the finest of everything, Rome in its wealth. And she has in her hand a gold cup full of nothing but evil, abominations. Remember, abominations is, a, is an Old Testament code word sometime for idolatry. And of the unclean things of her immorality. And so the imagery seems to me to be pretty transparent. Uh, it's not without significance, I think, that we're told in Matthew 27 and Mark 15 that when the Romans crucified Jesus, not, to, not the Jews, but this is what the Romans did to Jesus, they put on him a garment or a, a, a cape of scarlet and purple. These were things that the Romans understood very well as symbols of power. They were using them on Jesus in mockery, but John has now turned that around in this image. Uh, the jewelry is again an Old Testament image. I don't know if we have time this evening to, to read much of these, but in Ezekiel 28, does somebody, uh, can somebody go to that uh, passage, Ezekiel 28 uh, and verse 13? Uh, we'll come back to that in a second if somebody's got that. And then uh, the cup, we've seen the cup before. God has a cup full of wrath. And here this woman has a cup, a wine cup full of her wine. But it is, of course, the other side of that is the, the wine of God's wrath. Somebody have Ezekiel 28, 13? Go ahead, Steve. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Very precious stone was your covering. Sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your tambrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. God's there speaking about the king of Tyre. And he's saying you lived in with the best of everything. You were rich beyond comparison. And of course, that's a symbol of materialism and greed, and God judged that ancient city for its materialism and its godlessness, and God is going to do the same thing to this great city empire for the same reason. And so uh, it is a wicked harlot here, full of nothing but wickedness to give away, to share with others. And in verse 5, on her forehead a name was written. Uh, a couple things about that. 
It has been suggested by some that in the book of Revelation, when you see somebody getting a name written on their forehead, that that is a revelation of the true character of that person. And so God's people have his name written on their foreheads, and here this woman has a name written on her forehead. So it kind of tells you where this person belongs and what their uh, associations are. Uh, we see later in chapter 22 and verse 4 that uh, the saints will have uh, his name on their foreheads. But there's another side to that picture. Uh, and I think this is probably the more common side. To have a name written on a forehead, there's only one kind of person in the ancient world that ever had that, and that was a slave. And not just any slave. The only slaves you would have seen with marks on their forehead were the slaves that were rebellious and troublemakers, the rottenest slaves. And they would be tattooed on their forehead, sometimes branded with a mark to indicate that this is a rotten person. Maybe they had run away, maybe they had stolen something. But uh, in Greek culture, which John is writing in here, everybody knew that to have this mark on your forehead was a disgraceful thing. It's a sign that you had been punished and that you were just a rotten person. And so it seems to me that uh, when John says that she has a name written on her forehead, that not only is she a harlot and not only is she wicked, she's the worst of the wicked. She is especially uh, sinful and wears that mark of shame that the ancients would have recognized so easily. Well, John says in verse 5, on her forehead this name is a mystery, which I think John simply means by that is it is a symbolic name. And the name is Babylon the Great. That description is taken from Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30. Remember, Daniel sees, uh, or Nebuchadnezzar has his dream, and Daniel interprets it back there in Daniel chapter 4. And um, this is what Nebuchadnezzar says. The king reflected, is this not Babylon the great, which I myself has built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? In other words, Babylon was a, a reflection of the pride of Nebuchadnezzar. And so was Rome a reflection of the pride of the Romans. Everything about it said power, victory, conquest, superiority. And so when it is called Babylon the Great, it's not a compliment. It is a, a name that is given as a way of condemning it, that you think you're so great. And of course that arrogance always gets God's attention. And not only is she called Babylon, but she's also the mother of harlots. We have an expression like that today. You know, this is the mother of all whatever. Uh, and we mean that it is kind of the, the archetype. It is the, uh, the model that everything follows. Well, that's the sense of this here as well. That the most wicked of all, the, the source of all evil in a sense, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now again, abominations is code word for idolatry very often in the Old Testament. And this woman is drunk with the blood of the saints in verse 6, which is an idiom for her opposition against God's people. Uh, Josephus uses this language to describe the destruction of Jerusalem, talking about the rebels that he blames for the city's destruction. He says they had fed themselves from public evils and drank the blood of the city. They were oppressive people, in other words. And later on, he says they drank the blood of the populace to one another. In other words, they were evil people. They hurt other people, and they didn't care, and they did this to their own destruction. That's the picture here, that uh, she is drunk with the blood of the saints. She has filled herself up with the oppression of God's people and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. Remember, witnesses can also be translated martyrs. There's a little bit of a debate whether the word means that in the first century or not, but 
seems that you could probably make a case that there's some of that in view here. Remember we saw in chapter 11 the two witnesses that were slain and their body, bodies lay in the city, in the streets of that city for three days. And God raised them and took them to heaven. And we said that that was an image of the church in its witnessing to the world. And so there's no doubt as to who this harlot is by the time we get down through verse 6 that she is the enemy of God's people. John then says, verse uh, 6, John says, I, I saw her and I wondered. And the angel said, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. We'll leave the explanation, the hard part, for next week. So please read ahead verses 8 to the end of the chapter.